I'm Michael. I moved into the neighborhood a few weeks ago, excited about starting my new job as a journalist. The peaceful suburban life was a welcome change from the hustle and bustle of the city. My new house, with its white picket fence and small garden, felt cozy and inviting. The first few days were a whirlwind of unpacking and getting accustomed to the quiet streets. I made small talk with the friendly neighbors who seemed genuinely welcoming. As I settled in, I noticed that the community was close-knit, with everyone knowing each other's business. It was a stark contrast to the anonymity of city life. The Smiths, in particular, were frequently mentioned as the epitome of hospitality and charm. Their reputation for throwing exquisite dinner parties was almost legendary in the neighborhood. One sunny afternoon while I was tending to my garden, Richard and Margaret Smith approached me. They were an elegant couple, both in their mid-fifties, exuding an air of sophistication and warmth that immediately put me at ease. Richard, a successful businessman, and Margaret, a socialite known for her charity work, introduced themselves warmly. We've heard so much about you, Richard said, his smile genuine. We'd love for you to join us for dinner this weekend. Margaret added, we host a small gathering every now and then, just a few friends and neighbors. We'd be delighted if you could make it. Their invitation was delivered with such grace and charm that I found it impossible to refuse. I was flattered by their attention and eager to meet more people in the community. I accepted, looking forward to the evening. The night of the dinner party arrived, and I dressed in my best suit, wanting to make a good impression. As I entered, I was greeted by the other guests. Thomas Green caught my eye first. He seemed nervous and out of place, his eyes darting around the room. Jessica Dawson was a charming and sociable woman with a sharp wit, engaging everyone in lively conversation. Mark Bennett, an outgoing local politician with a magnetic personality, exuded confidence and charisma. Lastly, there was Rebecca Thompson, a shy and timid woman who seemed to prefer staying in the background. As the evening progressed, I found myself increasingly curious about the Smiths and their seemingly perfect life. Little did I know that beneath the surface of this charming dinner party lay a darkness that would soon shatter my sense of security. As I took my seat, the tantalizing aroma of the food made my mouth water. Each dish was presented with impeccable attention to detail, looking like it had been prepared by a professional chef. The Smiths clearly took great pride in their culinary skills and their enthusiasm was infectious. Conversation flowed easily at first, with lighthearted banter and laughter filling the room. However, as the evening progressed, I couldn't shake the feeling that there was an undercurrent of something unsettling. Richard and Margaret exchanged glances that seemed almost conspiratorial, their eyes meeting for just a fraction too long. It was subtle, but enough to plant a seed of unease in my mind. During the first course, Thomas, who had been nervously fidgeting since the start, managed to pull me aside. His hands trembled slightly as he whispered, I need to tell you something important. Before he could elaborate, Margaret appeared beside us, her smile a bit too tight. Is everything all right here? She asked, her tone polite, but with an edge that suggested she didn't appreciate private conversations. Thomas nodded quickly, his face pale. Yes, everything's fine he stammered, and Margaret guided us both back to the table. I couldn't help but notice Rebecca's discomfort as well. She avoided eye contact and picked at her food, barely eating. In stark contrast, Jessica and Mark were completely at ease, laughing and engaging in animated conversation with the Smiths. Their ease seemed almost rehearsed, a performance for the benefit of someone who needed convincing. Throughout the meal, Subtle, eerie hints about the unique taste of the food slipped into the conversation. This dish has a special ingredient, Margaret said with a sly smile. A family secret. Her words, though innocuous, made my skin crawl. As I glanced around the room, my eyes fell on a locked door near the dining area. Its presence nagged at my curiosity. Why would they keep a door locked during a dinner party? What could be behind it that was so important? As the courses progressed, my unease grew. The food, while undeniably delicious, had an odd taste that I couldn't quite place. The more I ate, the more I felt something was terribly wrong. 
The behavior of the hosts and some of the guests only added to my discomfort. Richard, ever the charming host, decided to entertain us with a story about the history of the house. His tone, which had been light and jovial, took on a darker edge as he delved into tales of old secrets and mysterious disappearances. This house has seen many things over the years, he said, his eyes gleaming with a strange light. If these walls could talk, they would tell quite the story. His words hung in the air, casting a shadow over the evening. My initial excitement had turned into a growing sense of dread, and I knew that I had to find out what was really going on in the Smith's house. Excusing myself to use the bathroom, I decided to take a quick look around. My journalist instincts kicked in, urging me to uncover the source of my unease. As I wandered through the hallway, the muffled sounds of laughter and conversation from the dining room faded, replaced by the quiet creaks of the old house. As I passed by the locked door again, I noticed something different. It was slightly ajar. My heart skipped a beat. I glanced around to make sure no one was watching, and then carefully pushed the door open. The hinges squeaked softly, revealing a hidden room shrouded in darkness. Inside, the room was a macabre tableau of horror. Photographs of previous dinner guests lined the walls, each labeled with dates and names. My blood ran cold as I recognized some of the faces from missing persons reports I had seen. Shelves were lined with jars of preserved body parts, their contents grotesquely displayed. At the center of the room was a butcher's setup, complete with bloodstained tools and a large wooden table. The realization hit me like a sledgehammer. The smiths were cannibals. My heart pounded in my chest as I processed what I had just discovered. The main course we were eating was human flesh. The thought made me nauseous, but I knew I had to keep my composure. Panic set in, but I forced myself to take a deep breath, trying to steady my nerves before returning to the dining room. I carefully masked my horror, acting as though nothing was amiss. With a forced smile, I rejoined the dinner, my mind racing with thoughts of how to escape and who I could trust. Every bite of food, every sip of wine felt like a betrayal of my own instincts but I had to maintain the facade. I discreetly informed Rebecca about what I had found, choosing a moment when no one else was paying attention. She was initially shocked, her eyes wide with fear, but she quickly understood the gravity of the situation. Her hand trembled slightly as she set down her fork. We have to get out of here, she whispered, her voice barely audible. Despite her initial shyness, Rebecca showed remarkable bravery and determination. Her eyes, once filled with timidity, now burned with a fierce resolve. We silently agreed to work together to find a way out. We communicated in whispers and subtle gestures, trying not to alert the others to our plan. Each glance, each nod was a silent promise of cooperation and survival. The atmosphere grew more tense with each passing minute, the weight of our shared secret pressing down on us. As the dinner continued, I felt the walls closing in, the room becoming a prison. The sense of urgency was palpable, and the stakes had never been higher. As the evening progressed, Richard and Margaret began to notice our unease. Their friendly smiles slowly faded, replaced by cold, calculating expressions. The shift was palpable, sending a chill down my spine. Richard stood up, clinking his glass to draw everyone's attention. It seems our new guest has discovered our little secret, he said, his voice devoid of the warmth it held earlier. Margaret chimed in, her tone equally cold. No need to pretend anymore. Let's be honest with each other. She paused, letting the gravity of her words sink in. We have unique culinary preferences. Fresh meat, to be specific. It's what sustains our lifestyle. My blood ran cold as they elaborated on their gruesome activities with chilling casualness. They detailed their methods, explaining how they lured unsuspecting guests, like us, into their home to become their next meal. Every word felt like a dagger, each revelation more horrifying than the last. To my growing horror, Jessica and Mark, who had seemed so amiable and engaging, revealed their complicity. We've been part of this for a long time, Jessica said her eyes gleaming with a twisted excitement. It's not just about survival. It's about the thrill. The power. 
Mark nodded in agreement, a cruel smile playing on his lips. The hunt, the feast, it's exhilarating. And now you're part of it too. With a swift motion, Richard locked the doors and windows, trapping us inside. The sound of the locks clicking echoed ominously through the room. The atmosphere shifted dramatically from a pleasant dinner party to a terrifying hostage situation. The friendly veneer had shattered completely, revealing the monsters beneath. Rebecca and I exchanged a glance, both of us realizing that escape would require cunning and bravery. The sense of immediate danger was overwhelming, every move feeling like a matter of life and death. My mind raced, trying to devise a plan while maintaining a calm exterior. Richard advanced towards us, his eyes filled with predatory intent. There's no escape, he said, his voice low and menacing. You're already in too deep. My heart pounded in my chest as I scanned the room for potential escape routes. The tension was unbearable, the air thick with the scent of danger and despair. The realization that our lives depended on our next moves was paralyzing but we couldn't afford to falter. Rebecca and I knew we had to act fast. Using the knowledge we had gathered and the information Thomas provided, we formed a plan. Thomas, initially paralyzed by fear, found his courage and joined us. His insider knowledge about the Smith's network proved vital. He revealed hidden passages, potential hiding spots, and the general layout of the house, which we could use to our advantage. We devised a series of signals and codes to communicate without alerting the others. A nod, a glance, a slight hand movement, each had a specific meaning. This ensured we could coordinate our efforts discreetly, avoiding the attention of our captors. Our alliance was fragile, but fueled by the desperate need to survive. Using household items and our newfound knowledge of the layout, we set traps throughout the house. We turned the Smith's domain against them utilizing their own tools and resources. Thomas showed us where to find various implements, and Rebecca's quick thinking helped us repurpose them into makeshift weapons and traps. We created diversions to distract Richard and Margaret, giving us time to prepare our escape route. Broken glass on the floor, strategically placed furniture, and loose objects that could be triggered into falling. All became part of our defensive arsenal. The tension built as we navigated the house, setting up our traps and avoiding detection. Every creak of the floorboards and whisper of movement heightened our fear. Each step had to be calculated and precise. Mm -hmm. Our first trap was sprung when Margaret tripped over a wire we had set near the dining room entrance, sending her crashing into a set of shelves. The noise drew Richard's attention, giving us a precious few moments to move into position. As Richard advanced, he stepped on a loose floorboard we had rigged to trigger a cascade of heavy objects from above. He dodged but it slowed him down enough for us to scatter. The showdown intensified as we lured Richard and Margaret into a corridor where we had set up our final defense. Furniture was overturned, and blood spattered the walls as the struggle became physical. Richard's strength was overwhelming, but Thomas, finding his courage, tackled him from behind. Meanwhile, Rebecca and I confronted Margaret, who fought with a viciousness that belied her genteel appearance. We managed to incapacitate Richard and Margaret. Richard was knocked unconscious by a heavy blow to the head from a makeshift club Thomas had fashioned. Margaret, cornered and desperate, was subdued after a fierce struggle, leaving her incapacitated on the floor. The fight was intense and brutal, each of us sustaining injuries, but the adrenaline kept us moving. The elegant home was now a war zone, filled with overturned furniture, shattered glass, and the unmistakable scent of blood. We had fought for our lives and emerged victorious, but the true test of our survival was yet to come as we sought to escape the house and expose the horrifying truth. As we regrouped after incapacitating Richard and Margaret, Thomas revealed the full extent of the Smiths' operation. He explained that the Smiths were part of a vast cannibalistic network that spanned across the country, involving influential members of society. The scale of the conspiracy was shocking reaching into the highest levels of wealth and power. But we quickly gathered as much evidence as we could from the hidden room and other parts of the house. Photographs of missing persons, detailed journals documenting their gruesome practices, and recordings of their dinner parties, all pointed to a well-organized and long-running operation. Each piece of evidence was more damning than the last. 
We knew that simply getting out alive wouldn't be enough. We had to bring justice to the victims and prevent further atrocities. This meant gathering irrefutable proof and finding a way to get it into the hands of the authorities. Just as we were finishing up our search, we heard footsteps approaching. Jessica and Mark, loyal to the Smiths and clearly aware of our intentions, burst into the room. Their eyes were filled with fury and determination. They knew we had uncovered too much. We can't let you leave, Jessica hissed, her demeanor now completely devoid of the charm she had shown earlier. Mark lunged at us, forcing us to scatter. The pursuit through the house was relentless. They used their intimate knowledge of the layout to their advantage, anticipating our moves and cutting us off at every turn. A series of close encounters and narrow escapes heightened the tension. We had to stay one step ahead, using our wits and the traps we had set up to outmaneuver them. In the dimly lit hallways and rooms, every shadow seemed a threat. Every sound amplified our fear. In one particularly narrow escape, we managed to lure Jessica into a room where we had set a tripwire. She stumbled and fell, giving us precious seconds to get away. But Mark was right behind us, his footsteps echoing menacingly as he closed in. The chase was harrowing. Moments of intense fear and adrenaline surged as we narrowly avoided capture time and again. At one point, Rebecca nearly got caught, but a quick diversion by Thomas gave her the chance to slip away. Our hearts pounded in unison, the gravity of our situation driving us forward. As we reached the ground floor, we realized we were running out of time and options. The sense of urgency was overwhelming. Every decision, every movement had to be perfect. One misstep could mean the difference between freedom and becoming the next victims of this horrific conspiracy. Desperation fueled our search as we tore through the study, knowing our time was running out. Finally, I found the keys hidden in a drawer. With my heart pounding, I signaled to Rebecca and Thomas, and we made a break for it, sprinting towards the front door. As we reached the foyer, the unmistakable sound of footsteps racing behind us grew louder. Jessica and Mark, realizing we were escaping, were hot on our heels. We flung open the front door and burst into the night, the eerie glow of the porch light casting long shadows on the lawn. The final confrontation happened outside the house. Jessica lunged at Rebecca, trying to drag her back inside. Mark tackled Thomas and they both tumbled onto the grass, wrestling furiously. I grabbed a fallen branch and swung it at Jessica, catching her off guard. Rebecca and I managed to overpower her, using our combined strength and the element of surprise. Meanwhile, Thomas was struggling with Mark, who was stronger and more determined. Rebecca joined the fray, and together, we managed to subdue him. With Jessica and Mark incapacitated, we fled down the street, our feet pounding the pavement as we sprinted toward safety. We didn't stop running until we reached a nearby house with its lights still on. Desperately, we banged on the door, and a startled elderly couple let us in. Panting and trembling, we explained our situation, showing them some of the evidence we had managed to keep with us. They immediately called the police. Within minutes, the house was surrounded by flashing lights and uniformed officers. Detective Lisa Monroe took charge of the investigation. Her sharp and determined demeanor gave us a glimmer of hope. We handed over all the evidence we had gathered. Photographs, journals, recordings, everything. Detective Monroe listened intently, her expression growing graver by the minute. She quickly mobilized her team to secure the Smith's house and arrest anyone involved. The Smiths and their accomplices were arrested, and a massive investigation was launched to uncover the full extent of their network. The neighborhood was in shock as the dark truth came to light. Friends and acquaintances who had once admired the Smiths were now horrified by the revelations. The media frenzy that followed ensured that the story reached a wide audience. News vans lined the street and reporters clamored for interviews. The exposure of the cannibalistic network became a national sensation, with people everywhere demanding justice for the victims. Rebecca, Thomas, and I found ourselves thrust into the spotlight. Our ordeal was far from over, but knowing that the Smiths' reign of terror had come to an end gave us some measure of peace. We remained in close contact, supporting each other as we tried to rebuild our lives. 
After the divorce, I knew we needed a fresh start. Moving to a small town seemed like the perfect solution, an opportunity to leave behind the painful memories and begin anew. My teenage daughter Ava, however, was less enthusiastic. Leaving behind her friends and familiar surroundings was a tough pill for her to swallow. I could see the struggle in her eyes, the silent battle she fought between supporting me and mourning the life she had to leave behind. The drive to our new home was filled with a heavy silence, punctuated only by the occasional soft sigh from Ava and the rhythmic hum of the car engine. As we turned onto Maple Street, I couldn't help but feel a mix of hope and trepidation. Our new house stood at the end of the street, slightly dilapidated but brimming with potential. The paint was peeling, and the garden was overgrown, but I could see past that to the charming home it once was, and could be again. Here we are, I said, trying to infuse my voice with as much enthusiasm as I could muster. Ava merely nodded, her eyes scanning the house with a skeptical glint. As we unpacked the car, an elderly woman approached us from the house next door. She had a warm smile and kind eyes that immediately put me at ease. Hello there. You must be the new neighbors. I'm Eleanor Martinez, she said, extending her hand. I shook her hand, grateful for the friendly gesture. Hi, I'm Sarah, and this is my daughter, Ava. Eleanor's smile widened. Welcome to the neighborhood. If you need anything, don't hesitate to ask. We're a close-knit community here. She chatted with us for a while sharing tidbits about the town and its history. Then, as if sensing the inevitable question, her expression grew serious. You should know about the house next door, she began, her voice dropping to a conspiratorial whisper. There was a brutal double murder there a few years ago. The surviving son, Mark Holloway, still lives there. A chill ran down my spine. Ava's eyes widened, and I could see the unease setting in. That's... unsettling. I managed to say. Eleanor nodded. It was a terrible thing, but the town has moved on. Mark keeps to himself mostly. Just thought you should know. As we continued unpacking, the sense of dread lingered in the back of my mind. This wasn't exactly the fresh start I had envisioned. But as I looked at Ava, determined to make the best of this situation, I knew we had to move forward. The house had potential, and so did our new life here. We would just have to face whatever came our way, one step at a time. Adjusting to our new surroundings proved to be a challenge for both Ava and me. Her first day at her new school was filled with apprehension. I watched her from the car as she reluctantly walked towards the entrance, her backpack slung over one shoulder and her head down. I knew she was dreading it, but I hoped that this change would eventually be good for her. When I picked her up in the afternoon, her face told a story of mixed emotions. How was it? I asked, trying to sound upbeat. Okay, I guess, she replied, shrugging. The teachers seem nice, but it's hard to fit in. Everyone already has their groups. I nodded, understanding her struggles. Give it time. You'll find your place. My own adjustment wasn't much easier. Starting a new job at the local hospital was daunting. On my first day, I met with the head nurse, who introduced me to my colleagues. They were polite, but somewhat reserved as people often are with newcomers. I immersed myself in my work, trying to establish a routine and prove myself to the team. One bright spot for Ava was meeting Jason Liu, a friendly and outgoing student who quickly took her under his wing. Jason was full of stories about the town's history, including the disappearances that had plagued the area over the years. You should be careful, he warned Ava one day after school. There are a lot of unsolved mysteries here. People just vanish sometimes. Ava listened, intrigued but also wary. The stories added to the uneasy feeling that had been growing since we moved in. A few days later, we had a visit from Detective Maria Sanchez and Officer Jake Patel. They introduced themselves and explained that they were there to ensure our safety and answer any questions we might have about the town. Welcome to the neighborhood, Detective Sanchez said with a warm smile. We want you to know that we're here for you. If you notice anything unusual or have any concerns, don't hesitate to reach out. Officer Patel nodded in agreement. Our job is to keep this community safe. You're in good hands. Their reassurance was comforting, but it didn't entirely erase the unease that lingered in the back of my mind. 
As much as I wanted to believe that we were safe, the stories and the strange behavior of our neighbor Mark kept me on edge. Our adjustment to the new town was slow, but the sense of unease never quite left us, largely due to our odd neighbor, Mark Holloway. From the first week, I noticed his reclusive nature. He rarely left the house during the day, but there were signs of activity at night, lights flickering on and off, shadows moving behind the curtains. It was unsettling, to say the least. One night I was jolted awake by a series of strange noises coming from Mark's house. I couldn't make out what they were, but they sounded like a combination of muffled thumps and scraping. I lay in bed, heart pounding, straining to listen. Ava fortunately slept through it. The next morning I mentioned the noises to her. She frowned, her concern mirroring my own. Do you think it's something bad, Mom? I don't know, sweetie, I replied, trying to sound more confident than I felt. But we should stay cautious. Mark's behavior grew increasingly peculiar. Whenever we crossed paths, he avoided eye contact and mumbled greetings that were barely audible. He always seemed to be in a hurry, glancing around nervously as if he expected someone to be watching him. His actions did nothing to alleviate our growing anxiety. Eleanor, our friendly neighbor, often stopped by for a chat. One afternoon as we sipped tea on the porch, I cautiously brought up Mark. Eleanor's expression darkened. Mark's been through a lot, she said, her voice low. Losing his parents like that? It's no wonder he's a bit off. But there's more, isn't there? I pressed gently. People around here seem to avoid him. Eleanor sighed. There's talk, of course. Some folks think he's dangerous, that he had something to do with those disappearances. But nothing's ever been proven. The gossip from Eleanor and other neighbors painted a chilling picture. Mark's parents had been murdered in that very house, and the details of the case were still murky. The town was rife with rumors about Mark's involvement, or at least his knowledge of what really happened. Our nightly routines became more cautious. I double-checked the locks on the doors and windows, and I made sure Ava stayed close. The strange noises continued sporadically, each one chipping away at my sense of security. We were strangers in a new town, trying to start over, but it felt like we were stepping into a nightmare. Despite the comforting presence of Detective Sanchez and Officer Patel, the fear was always there, lurking in the shadows. We were caught in a web of unease and suspicion, and I couldn't shake the feeling that something terrible was just around the corner. It was a Saturday afternoon when Ava made her unsettling discovery. I was in the kitchen, sorting through a stack of mail, when I heard her call out from the basement. Her voice had an edge to it that made me drop what I was doing and hurry down the stairs. Mom, you have to see this, she said, pointing to a small, almost invisible door tucked behind the water heater. It was an old wooden panel, partially covered in cobwebs. How did you find this? I asked, my voice tinged with disbelief. I dropped my bracelet and it rolled behind the heater, she explained. When I moved it, I saw the door. With a mixture of curiosity and apprehension, we managed to pry the door open. A narrow, dimly lit passage stretched out before us. Ava and I exchanged a look, both understanding the gravity of what we were about to do. Stay close to me, I whispered, and we cautiously stepped inside. The passage was cold and damp, and our footsteps echoed softly as we walked. It felt like we had been walking for hours, but it was probably only a few minutes before we reached the end. Another door, this one heavier and more foreboding, stood before us. Taking a deep breath, I pushed it open. We found ourselves in what appeared to be a hidden room in Mark's house. The room was filled with old furniture, stacks of newspapers, and personal items that looked out of place. But what caught our attention were the newspaper clippings plastered on the walls. Headlines about the murder of Mark's parents, articles about the disappearances, and most chillingly, detailed plans for future crimes. Ava gasped, her eyes wide with fear. Mom, look at this, she said, picking up a diary from a desk. The pages were filled with disturbing entries, detailing Mark's thoughts and plans. My heart pounded in my chest. The implications were terrifying. We had stumbled upon evidence that could potentially link Mark to the murders and the disappearances. But more than that, it seemed to reveal his intent to continue his gruesome activities. We need to get out of here, 
I said, my voice shaking. And we need to call the police. Now. We retraced our steps through the passage, emerging back in our basement, our minds racing with the enormity of what we had discovered. As soon as we were safely upstairs, I grabbed my phone and dialed Detective Sanchez's number. Detective, this is Sarah Nguyen. You need to come to my house immediately. We found something, something you need to see. The wait for the police to arrive felt like an eternity. When Detective Sanchez and Officer Patel finally showed up, we led them to the hidden passage in the secret room. Their faces grew graver with each piece of evidence they examined. This is significant, Detective Sanchez said, her voice steady but serious. We'll need to conduct a full investigation. Thank you for bringing this to our attention. Presenting the evidence to Detective Sanchez and Officer Patel was nerve-wracking. As we led them down to the basement and through the hidden passage, my mind raced with fears and doubts. What if they didn't believe us? What if Mark found out we had discovered his secret? As they began their work, I couldn't shake the feeling of dread that had settled over me. We had uncovered a dark secret, and it was clear that Mark Holloway was more dangerous than we had ever imagined. Our lives, it seemed, had become inextricably linked with the horrors that had transpired in the house next door. When we reached the secret room, Detective Sanchez and Officer Patel methodically examined every piece of evidence. They took photos, made notes, and bagged several items for further analysis. I could see the skepticism in their eyes slowly giving way to concern and determination. This is quite a discovery, Detective Sanchez said, her voice calm but firm. We'll need to take this back to the station and review everything thoroughly. You've done the right thing by calling us. Officer Patel nodded, his expression serious. We'll also need to keep an eye on Mark. If he's as dangerous as this evidence suggests, we can't afford to take any chances. As they left, the weight of what we had uncovered settled over me like a heavy blanket. The police presence around our neighborhood increased noticeably. Patrol cars drove by more frequently, and I saw officers stationed discreetly at various points along the street. It was a small comfort to know that they were watching over us. Mark's house, once eerily quiet, became the focus of constant surveillance. Plain clothes officers monitored his comings and goings, noting any suspicious behavior. Detective Sanchez assured us that they were building a case, but it was a slow and meticulous process. They needed to be certain they had enough evidence to move forward without any missteps. To address the growing concerns in the community, the police organized a town meeting at the local community center. Detective Sanchez stood at the front, explaining the situation in broad strokes, while emphasizing the importance of vigilance and safety. She didn't mention Mark by name, but it was clear to everyone who the focus of the investigation was. Please, if you see anything unusual or have any information, contact us immediately, she urged. We're working hard to ensure the safety of everyone in this community. Despite the increased police presence and their reassurances, the sense of unease persisted. The knowledge that a potential killer lived right next door kept me on edge, and I could see the strain it was putting on Ava. We tried to go about our daily lives, but the shadow of fear loomed large, reminding us that we were living in a nightmare that was far from over. Trying to bring some normalcy back to our lives, I decided to focus on revitalizing the neglected garden. It seemed like a good way to channel my anxiety into something productive. The overgrown weeds and tangled vines were a challenge, but I was determined to transform the space into a serene refuge for Ava and me. One sunny afternoon, with gardening gloves and a shovel, I set to work, clearing a particularly stubborn patch of weeds near the back fence. As I dug deeper, my shovel hit something hard. Expecting to find a large rock, I knelt down to investigate further. What I uncovered instead made my blood run cold. There, partially buried in the dirt, were human bones. My hands trembled as I uncovered more of the skeletal remains, the grim reality of what I was seeing sinking in. I stumbled back, my heart pounding, and fumbled for my phone to call the police. Detective Sanchez, it's Sarah Nguyen. You need to come over right away. I found... I found human bones in the garden. The panic in my voice must have conveyed the urgency, because Detective Sanchez and Officer Patel arrived within minutes, followed by a forensic team. 
They quickly cordoned off the area and began their meticulous work of unearthing the remains. Ava watched from the window, her face pale with fear. I wanted to reassure her, but I was struggling to keep my own emotions in check. The discovery of the bones was a horrifying confirmation of our worst fears. Detective Sanchez approached me, her expression grave. We'll need to conduct a thorough investigation. This is now an active crime scene. The forensic team worked late into the night, carefully collecting the bones and other evidence. The following days, Detective Sanchez informed us that the remains had been identified as belonging to one of the missing townspeople, a young woman who had vanished several years ago. This links directly to the unsolved disappearances we've been investigating, she explained. We'll need to dig deeper, both literally and figuratively. The revelation sent shockwaves through the community. The media swarmed our street, reporters eager for any details about the gruesome discovery. I did my best to shield Ava from the attention, but it was impossible to avoid completely. The sense of dread that had been building since we moved in now felt like a tangible weight, pressing down on us. As the police expanded their investigation, more patrols were deployed, and the surveillance on Mark intensified. The pieces of the puzzle were starting to come together, but the picture they formed was far more terrifying than we had ever imagined. Our garden, once a symbol of new beginnings, had become a graveyard, a chilling reminder of the darkness lurking just next door. Ava's determination to uncover the truth about Mark grew stronger each day. She spent countless hours at the local library, sifting through old newspapers and town records, looking for any clues that might connect Mark to the disappearances. Her dedication was unwavering, and I couldn't help but admire her resolve, despite the dangers. One evening, she laid out her findings on the kitchen table. Mom, look at this, she said, spreading out a map and several notes. I found a pattern. All the disappearances happened within a few blocks of our house, and they all occurred when Mark was in town. I examined the map, marked with red dots indicating the locations of the disappearances. It was compelling evidence. You're right, I said, feeling a chill run down my spine. There's definitely a connection. Ava continued. I also found references to hidden passages and old blueprints of the houses in our neighborhood. Mark could be using them to move undetected between his house and the others. The realization was horrifying. Mark had been using the hidden passage in our basement to carry out his crimes, right under our noses. We decided to present our findings to Detective Sanchez and Officer Patel the next day. The officers arrived promptly, their faces serious as they reviewed Ava's evidence. Detective Sanchez nodded thoughtfully. This is very helpful. It gives us a clearer picture of Mark's possible involvement. Mark seemed to become more aware of the scrutiny, and his behavior grew increasingly erratic. He started leaving subtle threats and warnings, broken windows, dead animals left on our doorstep, and ominous notes scribbled with chilling messages. Each new incident chipped away at our sense of security. Living in constant fear, I double-checked locks and kept a close eye on Ava whenever she left the house. The friendly small town we had hoped to find had turned into a place of fear and suspicion. But we were determined to see this through, to bring justice for the victims, and protect ourselves from the lurking danger next door. As the days passed, the tension in our lives escalated. The increased police presence and constant surveillance on Mark were meant to provide comfort, but they also served as a constant reminder of the threat that loomed over us. Mark's behavior grew more aggressive. One morning, we woke up to find our car window smashed. Another day, Ava discovered a dead bird placed ominously on our front porch. These acts of intimidation made it clear that Mark knew we were onto him, and he was not afraid to show it. We were living in a state of heightened alertness, and it was taking a toll on both of us. Ava became more withdrawn, her usual bright demeanor replaced with a wary, watchful attitude. I tried to stay strong for her sake, but the fear was always there, lurking in the back of my mind. In an effort to cope, we sought the help of Dr. Olivia Brown, the town's local psychologist. She was compassionate and insightful, offering us strategies to manage our anxiety and fear. Her office became a refuge, a place where we could speak openly about our experiences and find some semblance of peace. During one of our sessions, Dr. Brown suggested, 
It's important to find small ways to reclaim your sense of safety and normalcy. Maybe you could focus on something positive, like your garden project. I nodded, appreciating her advice. I've been meaning to work on the garden, but it's been hard to find the motivation. Start small, she encouraged. Even just a few minutes a day can make a difference. It's about taking control of your space and your life, bit by bit. Taking her words to heart, I resumed work on the garden, despite the chilling discovery of the bones. Ava joined me, and together we planted flowers and cleared away the overgrowth. It was therapeutic, a way to focus our minds on something beautiful amidst the chaos. But the sense of foreboding never fully left us. Mark's presence was a constant shadow, and every small sound or movement would set my nerves on edge. We knew that until he was apprehended, we would never truly feel safe. One evening as we were finishing up in the garden, Detective Sanchez stopped by with an update. We've gathered more evidence, but we need a bit more to make an arrest. We're close, but we need you to stay vigilant and report anything suspicious. Her words were both reassuring and unsettling. We were so close to ending this nightmare, yet the danger was still very real. As Detective Sanchez left, I looked at Ava, who was staring at the ground, deep in thought. We'll get through this, I said, trying to sound confident. We have to stay strong and support each other. Ava nodded, but her eyes reflected the same worry I felt. We were living in a pressure cooker, and it was only a matter of time before everything came to a head. Until then, all we could do was hold on and hope that the end was near. Detective Sanchez assured us that they were doing everything possible to keep us safe, but the sense of isolation and fear continued to grow. Despite the increased surveillance, the community remained on edge. Our neighbors, who once greeted us warmly, now kept their distance, wary of the danger that seemed to have settled over our street. Ava and I felt increasingly isolated. Detective Sanchez visited frequently to update us on the investigation. Her visits were a mix of reassurance and warnings. You need to be cautious and vigilant, she advised. We're building a case, but until we have concrete evidence, there are limitations to what we can do. I nodded, appreciating her honesty but wishing for more immediate action. What should we do in the meantime, I asked, my anxiety evident in my voice. Stay alert, she said firmly. Report any suspicious activity immediately. And remember, we're here for you. The reality of our situation was stark. We were living in a state of constant vigilance, the tension mounting with each passing day. Ava and I clung to each other, finding solace in our shared determination to see this through. The pressure on Mark was palpable. The increased police presence and our growing awareness of his actions seemed to push him to the brink. I could sense the desperation in his behavior, his movements more erratic and his actions more aggressive. One evening I had to run some errands, leaving Ava home alone for a short while. As I drove to the store, a sense of unease settled over me, but I pushed it aside, reminding myself of the police presence nearby. Meanwhile at home, Ava tried to distract herself with homework. She heard a faint noise coming from the basement and froze. Her heart pounded as she realized what it meant. Mark was using the hidden passage. Before she could react, Mark emerged, his face twisted with desperation. You're coming with me, he hissed grabbing her arm. Ava struggled, her fear fueling her attempts to break free. Let me go, she screamed, hoping someone would hear her. Mark dragged her through the hidden passage, his grip tightening with every step. Ava's mind raced with thoughts of escape, but the passage was dark and narrow, offering no immediate way out. She was taken to the hidden room in his house, the very place where we had discovered the chilling evidence of his crimes. Fear surged through her, as she realized the gravity of her situation. She knew she had to stay calm and think clearly, if she had any chance of escaping. Mark locked the door behind them. Why are you doing this? Ava asked, trying to buy herself some time and understand his motives. Mark's face contorted with a twisted sense of justification. You and your mother couldn't leave well enough alone. Now, you'll understand why no one can know the truth. As he turned away for a moment, Ava scanned the room, searching for anything she could use to defend herself or escape. Her heart raced, but she refused to give in to despair. She was determined to survive, 
to find a way out of this nightmare and get back to her mother. Meanwhile, I returned home to find the house eerily quiet. Panic set in as I called out for Ava and received no response. The realization of what had happened hit me like a ton of bricks. I grabbed my phone and called Detective Sanchez, my voice trembling with fear. Detective, it's Sarah. Ava's gone. I think Mark has taken her. Detective Sanchez's voice was calm but urgent. Stay where you are, Sarah. We're coming to you. Within minutes, the police arrived. We need to act fast, Detective Sanchez said, her voice steely. We'll organize an emergency search of Mark's house. The officers moved swiftly, coordinating their approach. Detective Sanchez took the lead, her experience evident in her calm, methodical planning. We need to surround the house and proceed with caution. Ava's safety is our top priority. Officer Patel nodded, relaying instructions to the other officers. They formed a perimeter around Mark's house, ready to move in on Detective Sanchez's signal. The front door was breached, and officers moved through the house, checking each room systematically. The air was thick with tension, every creak and shadow heightening the sense of urgency. As they approached the hidden room, they heard muffled sounds. Ava's voice, strained but determined. Detective Sanchez gestured for silence, and the officers prepared to enter the hidden room. With a nod, they burst through the door, weapons drawn. Mark stood in the center of the room, a wild look in his eyes. Ava was tied to a chair, her face pale but resolute. The officers moved swiftly, securing Mark and ensuring Ava's safety. Mark struggled, shouting incoherently, but he was quickly subdued and handcuffed. Detective Sanchez approached Ava, her expression softening. You're safe now, she said gently, untying her bonds. We've got you. Tears of relief streamed down Ava's face as she was freed. The tension in the room eased as Mark was led away, his reign of terror finally at an end. The officers escorted Ava out of the house, reuniting her with me. I hugged her tightly, the fear and worry of the past hours melting away in a flood of relief and gratitude. The days following Mark's arrest were filled with significant changes, both for our home and our community. One of the first steps we took was to permanently seal the hidden passage between our house and Mark's. The police ensured it was securely closed off, removing any lingering fear of what it had represented. As the physical reminders of our ordeal were addressed, we focused on rebuilding our connections with the community. Our neighbor, Eleanor Martinez, was a constant source of support. Her warm presence and kind words helped us feel anchored and accepted. Ava grew closer to her friend, Jason Liu who had been a pillar of strength for her throughout the ordeal. Their bond deepened, and together they became more active in school and community events. They volunteered at local initiatives, helping to foster a renewed sense of unity and purpose in the town. I, Michael Lawson, a renowned author, moved into a charming old house in a quiet neighborhood of a small town. I sought solace, after a traumatic incident had shattered my life in the city. The move represented a fresh start, a chance to escape the memories that haunted me and find peace in a new environment. The neighborhood seemed idyllic at first glance. Tree-lined streets, well-kept gardens, and the gentle hum of small-town life offered a stark contrast to the chaotic, frenetic pace of the city. My new home, a quaint Victorian with a spacious yard, promised the peace and quiet I needed to focus on writing and healing. As I unpacked boxes and set up my new office, I felt a flicker of hope that this place might finally bring the tranquility I craved. On the very day I moved in, there was a knock at the door. I opened it to find a middle-aged woman with a bright smile and a homemade pie in her hands. Welcome to the neighborhood. I'm Karen Walker from across the street, she said, her tone overflowing with enthusiasm. She was overly friendly insisting on helping me settle in, offering advice on local services, and sharing snippets of gossip about other residents. Although I appreciated her kindness, I couldn't help but feel a bit overwhelmed by her eagerness. Privacy was what I sought in this move, and Karen's relentless cheerfulness was already making me feel claustrophobic. A few hours later, while taking a break from unpacking, I decided to introduce myself to my next-door neighbor. Mr. Harold Harper was an elderly man who seemed to keep to himself. 
His house, slightly run down, stood in stark contrast to the other pristine homes on the street. As I approached, I saw him sitting on his porch, staring out at the street with a distant, contemplative look. When I greeted him, he responded with a curt nod and a gravelly, Hello. Our conversation was brief. He was reclusive and not one for small talk. I learned that he lived alone and had been in the neighborhood longer than anyone else. Despite his reticence, there was something about Mr. Harper that piqued my curiosity. He was often seen watching the neighborhood from his porch, a silent observer of all that happened. I wondered what stories he might have, what secrets he kept behind those watchful eyes. But for now, I respected his solitude, understanding all too well the desire to be left alone. As the sun set, and I closed the curtains on my first day in the new house, I felt a mix of relief and unease. The neighborhood, with its veneer of tranquility, held an undercurrent of mystery. Karen's overly friendly demeanor, Mr. Harper's silent vigilance, these elements stirred a writer's curiosity within me. Yet, I reminded myself that I was here to heal, to find peace. Little did I know, my search for solace would soon lead me into a web of intrigue and danger, far more real than any plot I had ever penned. A few days after moving in, I started receiving anonymous letters. At first, they contained innocuous observations about my daily routine. Comments about my morning jog, the times I left the house, the books I read on the porch. Initially, I dismissed them as the work of a harmless busybody. However, the letters quickly became more personal and invasive, describing intimate details of my life that only someone watching me closely would know. The thought of being observed without my knowledge sent a chill down my spine. My initial suspicion fell on Mr. Harper. His house, with its peeling paint and overgrown garden, looked eerie, especially at dusk. He often sat on his porch, staring at the street with a watchful eye. I began to notice him observing me at odd hours, his gaze following me as I moved about my yard. The thought of him being the one behind the letters unsettled me deeply. I tried to avoid drawing his attention, but I couldn't shake the feeling of being constantly watched. Meanwhile, Karen's visits became more frequent and intrusive. She no longer waited for an invitation, but started showing up unannounced. One morning, I found her at my doorstep with a casserole. Just thought you might like a home-cooked meal, she said, stepping inside before I could protest. She offered to help with chores, asked personal questions, and pried into my life with relentless curiosity. Her kindness felt suffocating, her presence increasingly invasive. As I tried to distance myself from her, Karen's behavior shifted. She began to spread rumors about me in the neighborhood. I overheard whispers of her telling others that I was unfriendly, unstable, even dangerous. The neighbors, influenced by her gossip, started to keep their distance. I sensed their wariness, their reluctance to engage with me. The isolation grew, making the sense of unease even stronger. As if the anonymous letters and Karen's intrusion weren't enough, strange things started happening around town. People claimed to have seen me in places I hadn't been, doing things I hadn't done. My reputation began to suffer as the impersonator's actions tarnished my image. A shopkeeper accused me of being rude. A librarian said I borrowed books I had no recollection of taking. The doppelganger seemed to be everywhere, eroding the trust I was trying to build in this new place. The realization hit hard. Someone was impersonating me. This person knew intimate details about my life and past trauma, using that knowledge to undermine me. The thought of someone wearing my face and destroying my reputation was terrifying. I started to investigate, trying to uncover who this impersonator could be and what their motives were. My search led me to a troubling discovery. The impersonator was connected to a local cult with sinister intentions. This cult, hidden beneath the surface of the seemingly peaceful town, had a history of manipulating and controlling influential figures. They saw me as a potential asset, someone they could use for their own nefarious purposes. My suspicion about Mr. Harper grew. Late one night I noticed him sneaking around the neighborhood, moving with a stealth that seemed out of character for an elderly man. Driven by curiosity and a need to protect myself, I decided to investigate. One night, I sneaked into his house, making my way to the basement. What I found there chilled me to the bone. 
The basement was filled with surveillance equipment and files on every resident of the neighborhood. Photos, notes, and recordings detailed the comings and goings of everyone, including me. It was a meticulous record of our lives, a diary of the entire community. I was stunned by the scope of the surveillance, the invasive nature of Mr. Harper's observations. Just as I was processing the enormity of the situation, Mr. Harper caught me. My heart raced, expecting anger or a confrontation. Instead, he looked tired, defeated. He sat me down and explained his predicament. Mr. Harper had been coerced by the cult to monitor the neighborhood. They threatened his estranged family, using them as leverage to ensure his compliance. He was a reluctant participant, trapped in a web of fear and control. He told me about the cult's influence, how they manipulated people, and kept tabs on everyone through him. His revelations added a new layer of dread to my situation. The cult wasn't just watching. They were planning, orchestrating events to maintain their grip on the town. Mr. Harper's sorrow and regret were palpable, and I realized he was as much a victim as anyone else. With this newfound knowledge, I understood the gravity of my situation. I wasn't just dealing with nosy neighbors or a simple impersonator. I was up against a well-organized, dangerous cult that saw me as their next target. The sense of isolation deepened, but so did my resolve. I needed to protect myself, uncover the truth, and find a way to break free from their sinister grasp. Realizing the danger I was in, I decided to leave town. The sense of urgency grew stronger with each passing hour, knowing that my very safety was at stake. However, as I hastily packed my belongings, Karen showed up at my door, flanked by a group of menacing individuals. Their presence filled me with a sinking dread. Going somewhere, Michael? Karen's voice was cold, devoid of the warmth she once feigned. The men surrounded me, blocking any chance of escape. Your departure would be most unfortunate, she continued, her eyes glinting with malice. We have plans for you. You see, your fame and influence can serve our purpose as well. We intend to use your talents to further our cause and you will comply. I tried to resist, but they overpowered me, dragging me into a car and driving me to an undisclosed location. My heart pounded as I realized the full extent of my peril. The cult, led by Karen, intended to control me through fear and manipulation. They demanded that I write and promote content that aligned with their agenda, threatening my life and promising to ruin my career if I resisted. Hours passed in a haze of fear and uncertainty. The cult confined me to a dimly lit room, guarded at all times. In this captivity, my thoughts turned to Mr. Harper. I had to find a way to contact him. If anyone could help me gather evidence and devise a plan, it was him. Under the watchful eyes of my captors, I managed to slip a coded message to Mr. Harper through a guard who seemed less vigilant. It was a gamble, but it was my only hope. Days later, to my immense relief, Mr. Harper responded. He was reluctant but agreed to help, driven by a desire to end the cult's grip on both of us. Together, we formulated a plan. We needed to gather concrete evidence of the cult's activities and their threats against me. Mr. Harper sneaked into his basement, retrieved recordings, documents, and other damning materials. His meticulous records became our lifeline, detailing the cult's operations and their manipulative tactics. Next, I managed to covertly contact my trusted friend in law enforcement, Detective Melanie Mitchell. Through a clandestine phone call, I explained my situation and the cult's sinister plans. Melanie, determined to help, began to devise a rescue operation, ensuring that the authorities would be ready to intervene at the right moment. The day of reckoning arrived. The cult, unaware of our preparations, prepared to initiate their plan involving me. They brought me into a room filled with recording equipment, demanding that I start producing content for their agenda. The room buzzed with anticipation as cult members, including Karen, gathered to witness my compliance. But I had a plan. With a small hidden recording device, I captured their threats and confessions. I feigned cooperation, biding my time, waiting for the right moment to expose them. The tension in the room was palpable, the cult members confident in their control over me. Just as the situation reached a boiling point, I sprang my trap. You think you can control me? 
I shouted, my voice echoing through the room. The cult members froze, confusion and anger flashing across their faces. In that moment, Detective Mitchell and her team burst into the room, guns drawn, demanding everyone to stand down. The cult members were caught off guard, their confidence shattered. Karen tried to flee, but the authorities quickly apprehended her, along with several other key figures. In the ensuing chaos, Alex Thompson, the impersonator, was unmasked. His shocked expression mirrored the betrayal felt by the other cult members as they realized their carefully constructed facade was crumbling. The evidence I collected, along with Mr. Harper's records, ensured that the cult's activities were exposed in full. The authorities gathered the necessary proof to bring charges against the perpetrators, ensuring that justice was served. Karen, who had orchestrated the entire scheme, was defiant to the end. You'll never stop us, she hissed as she was led away in handcuff, but her threats rang hollow. The cult's power had been broken, their influence shattered. Detective Mitchell approached me, her expression one of relief and determination. You did it, Michael. You exposed them. Now they'll pay for what they've done. As the dust settled, I looked around the room, taking in the scene. The nightmare was over. The cult members were in custody, and I was free from their grasp. The relief was overwhelming, but so was the realization of how close I had come to losing everything. Mr. Harper, standing beside me, looked more at peace than I had ever seen him. Thank you, he said quietly for everything. With the cult dismantled and the truth revealed, the neighborhood began to return to normal. The authorities' swift action ensured that the key members of the cult, including Karen and Alex Thompson, faced justice. Mr. Harper, now free from the cult's grip, reunited with his estranged family. Seeing him embrace his daughter and grandchildren for the first time in years brought a sense of closure. His cooperation was instrumental in bringing down the cult and he received the support and compassion he deserved from the community. For me, the closure came in the form of validation and justice. The neighbors, who once viewed me with suspicion and distance due to Karen's manipulative rumors, began to understand the ordeal I went through. They learned the truth about the cult's influence and Karen's deception. Their attitudes shifted, and they started to see me not as an outsider, but as a resilient survivor who helped expose a sinister threat lurking in their midst. Despite the newfound sense of community, I decided it was time to leave the neighborhood for good. The memories of the harrowing experience were too vivid, and I yearned for a fresh start in a new city. The decision was bittersweet, but necessary for my continued healing. The ordeal had been a crucible, testing my resilience and resolve. It had also given me a new sense of purpose. The story of my entanglement with the cult and the subsequent fight for justice became the inspiration for my next novel. Pouring my experiences onto the page was cathartic, transforming trauma into a gripping thriller that captivated readers. The book became a bestseller, resonating with many who saw it as a story of survival and justice. Through my writing, I found peace, knowing that I had turned my darkest moments into something meaningful and impactful. The success of the novel also reaffirmed my belief in the power of storytelling to shed light on hidden truths and inspire resilience. I woke up to a harsh, sterile light and the rhythmic beeping of medical machines. My head throbbed, and my vision blurred as I tried to make sense of my surroundings. The unmistakable scent of antiseptic filled the air, mingling with a faint, unpleasant odor I couldn't quite place. Panic welled up inside me as I realized I had no memory of how I got there, or who I was. A man sat beside my bed, holding my hand tightly. His eyes, a piercing blue, were filled with concern, and something else I couldn't quite identify. He introduced himself as John, claiming to be my husband. His voice was soothing, but there was an intensity in his grip and an overprotectiveness in his demeanor that made me uneasy. Everything will be all right, he assured me, his voice smooth and practiced. You were in a car accident, but you're safe now. Just focus on getting better. I nodded weakly, my mind spinning with questions. Who was I? What happened to me? Why did he seem so... off? 
My instincts screamed that something wasn't right, but I couldn't put my finger on it. My body felt heavy, and my thoughts were muddled, as if I was wading through thick fog. I closed my eyes, hoping for some clarity when I woke up again. But even in the darkness behind my eyelids, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was missing something vital, something important about myself, and this man who called himself my husband. The fear gnawed at me, but for now, all I could do was trust him and hope that my memories would return soon. John brought me home a few days later, after the doctors deemed me fit enough to leave. The house was a charming two-story in a quiet suburban neighborhood, with a neat lawn and flower beds bursting with color. It felt both familiar and strange, like a dream I couldn't quite grasp. John kept a steady arm around my waist as we walked inside, his touch both reassuring and confining. Welcome home, Daria, he said softly, his voice tinged with an emotion I couldn't read. This is where we live. I thought being here might help jog your memory. I nodded, taking in the surroundings. The living room was cozy, filled with comfortable furniture and decorated with pictures of us. Smiling at a beach, posing at a park, celebrating what looked like a birthday. I recognized myself in the photos, but they felt like images of a stranger. You should rest, John insisted, guiding me to a plush sofa. You've been through a lot. Your body needs time to heal. I agreed, feeling a deep weariness settle into my bones. But as I sat there, my eyes wandered around the room, trying to piece together my life from the fragments around me. A bookshelf filled with novels, a piano in the corner, a vase of fresh flowers on the coffee table. Everything seemed perfectly in place, yet something felt off, like a puzzle with a missing piece. After a while I got up, my curiosity overpowering my fatigue. I started to explore the house, moving slowly from room to room. The kitchen was spotless, every appliance gleaming. The dining room held a large wooden table, set for two. Upstairs I found our bedroom, decorated in soft, calming colors. I opened drawers and closets, finding clothes and personal items that should have felt familiar but didn't. In the hallway I came across a closed door. Something about it drew me in. I reached for the handle, but before I could turn it, John's voice called out from behind me. Daria, please. You need to rest. His tone was gentle but firm, leaving no room for argument. I stepped back feeling a strange mix of frustration and fear. What was behind that door? Why didn't he want me to see it? I returned to the living room, my mind swirling with questions. John sat beside me, taking my hand in his. Everything will come back in time, he said. But his eyes betrayed a flicker of something. Worry? Guilt? I couldn't be sure. As the days passed, I found myself growing more restless. The house was beautiful. Our life seemed perfect, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was terribly wrong. And every time I passed that closed door, my unease deepened. One afternoon, while John was out, I decided to venture into the basement. The air was cooler down there, and it felt almost like stepping into a different world. The walls were lined with shelves filled with various tools and old dusty boxes. As I explored, my eyes landed on a door at the far end of the basement. It was locked. Curiosity prickled at the back of my mind. What could be behind that door? I reached for the handle, but it didn't budge. Just as I started to examine the lock more closely, I heard John's footsteps descending the stairs. What are you doing down here? His voice was sharp, a stark contrast to the gentle tones he had used with me before. I was just exploring, I replied, trying to sound casual. I found this door, and I was wondering what's behind it. John's expression hardened. That's just an old storage room. It's not safe. There are a lot of heavy items and some exposed wires. You shouldn't be messing around down here. His strictness only fueled my curiosity and suspicion. But why is it locked? I pressed. It's for your safety, Daria, he said firmly. Please, just trust me on this. He gently but firmly took my arm and guided me back upstairs leaving me with more questions than answers. The days following my exploration of the basement were filled with a growing unease. I started having fleeting flashbacks, fragmented and disjointed images of a little girl. 
She had curly dark hair and bright blue eyes. These memories would surface at odd times, while washing dishes, brushing my hair, or lying in bed. They were brief but vivid, leaving me with a sense of longing and confusion. In these flashes, I saw her laughing as she ran through a garden, crying as she scraped her knee, and smiling up at me with pure love in her eyes. Who was she? Why did I feel such a strong connection to her? The more I tried to piece together these memories, the more elusive they became, slipping through my grasp like water. Driven by the need to understand these visions, I decided to return to the locked room in the basement when John was away. With a hairpin, I managed to pick the lock, a skill I didn't know I had until then. Inside, the room was dark and musty, filled with old furniture and boxes. As I rummaged through them, my heart pounded with anticipation and fear. In one of the boxes, I found a stack of photographs. My breath caught in my throat as I recognized the little girl from my flashbacks. There were pictures of her at various ages, often with me, looking happy and carefree. I couldn't ignore the undeniable bond I saw in these images. The inexplicable connection I felt was now substantiated by these tangible memories. When John returned home, I confronted him. Who is the little girl in these photos? I asked, holding one up. Why don't I remember her? John's face paled, and he avoided my gaze. Daria, please, you've been through a lot. I don't think you're ready to deal with this yet. But I need to know, I insisted. Please, John, tell me the truth. He sighed, rubbing his temples. Her name is Elise, he finally said. She... She disappeared around the time of your accident. I didn't want to overwhelm you with this, considering everything you're already dealing with. His words sent a shockwave through me. My mind raced with the implications. How could I have forgotten my own daughter? A few days later, Lisa, a family friend, visited. She was a warm, motherly figure with kind eyes and a gentle smile. We sat in the living room, sipping tea. She seemed genuinely concerned for me, but carefully avoided talking about the past. I've been having these memories, I told her, hoping she could shed some light. Of a little girl. John told me her name is Elise, and that she disappeared around the time of my accident. What happened to her, Lisa? Lisa's face went pale, and she shifted uncomfortably in her seat. Daria, it's... it's complicated, she said, choosing her words carefully. You went through so much. Maybe it's better to focus on your recovery. I need to know, I insisted. Please, Lisa. I can't move forward until I understand what happened. She hesitated, then finally sighed. Elise is your daughter, she admitted. She vanished the night of your accident. The police searched for months, but there was no trace of her. It was a terrible time. John, he was devastated, and so were you. But then the accident happened, and you lost your memory. John didn't want to burden you with it until you were stronger. Her words hit me like a punch to the gut. My daughter missing and I had no memory of it. The sense of loss was overwhelming, and tears welled up in my eyes. Why didn't anyone tell me? I whispered. We thought it was best for you, Lisa said softly. But maybe now, knowing will help you heal. I'm here for you, Daria. Whatever you need. I nodded, feeling a mix of gratitude and sorrow. The pieces of my life were slowly falling into place, but the picture they were forming was far more tragic than I could have imagined. Lisa's revelation about Elise haunted me, pushing me to dig deeper into my forgotten past. Determined to uncover the truth, I started searching the house methodically whenever John was out. I contacted old friends and neighbors hoping to piece together more details about my life and Elise's disappearance. One day, while exploring the locked room in the basement, I found a small, weathered journal hidden behind a stack of old magazines. The cover was plain, but when I opened it, I saw Rebecca's name written inside. My hands trembled as I began to read. Rebecca's journal detailed her affair with John, describing their secret meetings and the guilt she felt. But more chillingly, she wrote about her fears for Elise's safety. Rebecca had suspected that John was hiding something sinister, and she worried that he might harm Elise to keep their affair secret. 
Each entry filled me with dread and anger. I couldn't believe John was capable of such deceit and potential violence. The more I read, the clearer it became that Rebecca had been trying to protect Elise from John. The journal ended abruptly, with Rebecca planning to confront John about Elise's safety. With this new information, I knew I had to be cautious. I couldn't trust John, and I needed to find more evidence to confirm my suspicions. I decided to approach Tom, our neighbor, who had always seemed to be watching us closely. Tom was an older man in his late forties, known for being observant and somewhat reclusive. I knocked on his door, and he answered with a look of surprise. Daria, what brings you here? He asked, his eyes narrowing with curiosity. Tom, I need to talk to you about John and Rebecca, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. I've been remembering things and found some disturbing information. Can you help me? Tom hesitated for a moment, then nodded and invited me inside. We sat in his cluttered living room. I've been worried about you, he admitted. I've seen things that don't add up. Like what? I prompted, leaning forward. I saw John and Rebecca arguing the night she disappeared, Tom said. It was late, and they were in the backyard. I couldn't hear everything, but it was heated. Rebecca looked scared, and John was furious. His words sent a shiver down my spine. Did you see anything else? Rebecca left in a hurry, and John followed her. I didn't see what happened next, but the next morning she was gone and you had your accident. It all seemed too coincidental. I took a deep breath, trying to process this new information. Tom, do you think John had something to do with Elise's disappearance too? Tom nodded slowly. I've always suspected it. John's behavior changed after that night. He was more secretive, more controlling. I didn't have any proof, but I've kept an eye on him, especially after you came back from the hospital. With Tom's observations and Rebecca's journal, the puzzle pieces were starting to come together. John had been hiding the truth from me, and it was up to me to uncover the whole story. Tom agreed to help me, and we planned to gather more evidence and find out what really happened to Rebecca and Elise. As I left Tom's house, a sense of determination filled me. I wouldn't rest until I knew the truth and could protect Elise from whatever danger John posed. The fight for my memories and my daughter was just beginning, and I was ready to face it head on. As I gathered more evidence against John, his demeanor shifted. Confronted with mounting suspicions, he grew increasingly hostile. One evening, I decided to confront him with Rebecca's journal. His reaction was immediate and intense. How dare you go through my things, John shouted, his face red with anger. You're letting your imagination run wild, Daria. Rebecca was unstable, and you know that. I stood my ground, clutching the journal tightly. These are her words, John. She was scared of you, and she was worried about Elise. John's eyes narrowed, and he took a step closer, his voice lowering to a menacing whisper. You're confused, Daria. Your memory is playing tricks on you. You don't remember things correctly. You need to trust me. I'm your husband. His words were like poison, seeping into my mind and making me doubt myself. But I couldn't ignore the evidence. I know what I've seen, John. And I won't stop until I find out the truth. He sighed, shaking his head. You're not well, Daria. You need help. Maybe we should see Dr. Miller again. His attempts to gaslight me were relentless, but I clung to the fragments of my memories and the evidence I had gathered. I knew I had to remain strong, for Elise and for myself. With Tom's help, I continued to gather evidence from the locked room and my fragmented memories. We spent hours sifting through old documents, photographs, and anything that might provide a clue. One afternoon, we made a breakthrough. In the back of the locked room, Behind a stack of old furniture, we discovered a hidden compartment. My heart raced as we pried it open, revealing a small cache of documents and items. Among them were financial records showing large, unexplained withdrawals around the time of Rebecca's disappearance. This is it, Tom said, holding up the records. This proves John was hiding something. I nodded, feeling a mix of relief and dread. We need to find more. There has to be something here that links him directly to Rebecca and Elise. As we continued to search, we found more incriminating evidence. Old photographs of John and Rebecca together, 
looking far too intimate for mere acquaintances. Notes and letters from Rebecca, expressing her fears and her plans to leave John and take Elise somewhere safe. Finally, we uncovered the most damning piece of evidence, a letter from John to someone named Mark, discussing plans to deal with the situation regarding Rebecca and Elise. The letter was dated the night of Rebecca's disappearance. This is it, I said, my voice shaking. This proves he was involved. Tom nodded, his expression grim. We need to take this to the police. It's time to expose John for what he is. But before we could act, we heard the sound of the front door opening. John was home early. Panic surged through me as I realized we were running out of time. We have to hide this, I whispered, frantically gathering the documents. He can't know we found it. Tom helped me quickly stash the evidence back into the hidden compartment, covering it up as best we could. We barely had time to compose ourselves before John appeared at the top of the stairs, his eyes narrowing as he took in the scene. What's going on down here? he demanded, his voice edged with suspicion. Just cleaning up, I replied, trying to sound casual. This place was a mess. John's gaze lingered on me for a moment, then shifted to Tom. You should go, he said coldly. Tom nodded, giving me a reassuring look before he left. As John's eyes returned to me, I knew the confrontation was far from over. But now, I had the evidence I needed. The truth was within reach, and I was more determined than ever to expose John and find Elise. With the evidence I had gathered, I began to piece together the events leading up to my accident. The more I uncovered, the clearer it became. John had an affair with Rebecca. When she threatened to expose him and take Elise away, he took drastic measures to ensure his secrets remained buried. My accident had been no accident at all. John had orchestrated it to keep me silent and maintain control over the situation. As I dived deeper into Rebecca's journal and the hidden documents, I discovered that Rebecca had been desperately trying to protect Elise. She had hidden our daughter with a trusted friend, fearing what John might do if he ever found them. The last entry in her journal detailed her plan to confront John one final time, a plan that tragically ended in her disappearance. Realizing the extent of John's deception and the danger Elise was still in, I knew I had to act quickly. I couldn't let John find Elise, and I couldn't let him continue to manipulate and control our lives. Armed with the truth and the damning evidence, I prepared to confront John. I waited until he returned home my heart pounding with a mix of fear and determination. When he walked through the door, I stood firm, holding Rebecca's journal and the incriminating documents. John, we need to talk, I said, my voice steady, despite the adrenaline coursing through me. He glanced at the items in my hands and his expression darkened. What is this, Daria? This is the truth, I replied, throwing the documents onto the table. I know about your affair with Rebecca. I know you orchestrated my accident to keep me quiet. And I know you've been hiding the truth about Elise. John's face twisted with rage. You don't know what you're talking about. You're confused, Daria. No, I'm not, I said, my voice rising. I remember everything now. And I have proof. Rebecca's journal, the financial records, the letters. It's all here. His eyes flickered with panic. Then he lunged at me, knocking the documents to the floor. You should have stayed out of it, he snarled. You've ruined everything. The confrontation turned violent as John tried to overpower me. But I was ready. I fought back with all my strength, fueled by the need to protect Elise and bring John to justice. Just as it seemed he might gain the upper hand, Tom burst through the door, having sensed something was wrong. Get away from her, John, Tom shouted, rushing to my aid. We managed to subdue John. He fought viciously, but we outmaneuvered him. In the chaos, I grabbed the documents and we made our escape from the house. Tom drove us to the police station, where I handed over the evidence to Detective Parker. This proves everything, I said, my voice shaking with relief and exhaustion. John is responsible for Rebecca's disappearance and my accident, and he's been hiding Elise. Detective Parker nodded, taking the evidence. We'll take it from here, Daria. You did the right thing coming to us. As John was arrested and taken into custody, I felt a weight lift from my shoulders. 
The nightmare was far from over, but we had taken the first crucial step towards justice and finding Elise. With Tom's support, I began the journey of reclaiming my life and reuniting with my daughter. The road ahead was uncertain, but for the first time, I felt a glimmer of hope. We had faced the darkness and emerged stronger, ready to build a future free from John's shadow. With John in custody, Tom and I followed the clues from Rebecca's journal to a small house on the outskirts of town. The tension was palpable as we approached, each step filled with anticipation and fear. When we knocked, a woman opened the door, Rebecca's trusted friend Mary. We're here for Elise, I said, my voice trembling. Mary's eyes widened in recognition, and she stepped aside to reveal a small girl hiding behind her legs. Elise. The sight of her took my breath away. She was just as I remembered from the fragmented flashbacks, with her curly dark hair and bright blue eyes. Elise, I whispered, kneeling down to her level. It's mommy. She looked at me, scared and confused at first, but then a spark of recognition lit up her eyes. Mommy? She asked hesitantly. Tears streamed down my face as I nodded. Yes, baby. It's me. She ran into my arms and we embraced, overwhelmed by the emotions of our long-awaited reunion. The moment I stepped onto the sprawling grounds of my great-uncle's estate, a chill ran through me. Not from the crisp autumn air, but from the sheer isolation of the place. Nestled deep within dense woods, the mansion stood as a lonely sentinel, its towering silhouette that seemed to whisper secrets of a forgotten past. My great uncle, a reclusive and somewhat eccentric doll maker, had lived and died here, leaving the property to me by some twist of familial fate. As I pushed open the heavy front door, the air inside smelled of dust and disuse, the kind of stagnation that speaks to years without a living soul to stir its corners. The main hall was lined with portraits, their eyes seeming to follow my every step. It was in the deeper rooms of the house that I found them. Dozens of dolls, arranged with painstaking care on shelves and in display cases. Each was beautifully crafted, with faces so lifelike and expressions so detailed, they seemed on the verge of speaking. The dolls weren't just masterpieces of artistry. They were unnervingly real. A room further into the mansion held a wall covered in photographs. Pictures of children, each frozen in time. My stomach turned as I realized the dolls bore a disturbing resemblance to these children. The eyes that seemed to follow me around the room weren't just in the paintings anymore. They were in the glassy gazes of these dolls, each one silently telling a story I wasn't sure I wanted to hear. This was my initial encounter with my great-uncle's legacy a legacy that felt as eerie as the shadows lengthening outside as the sun began to set. As the days lengthened into my first week at the estate, my curiosity drove me deeper into the heart of my great-uncle's world. Within the musty corners of his study, I uncovered stacks of old personal diaries and scattered police reports. The writings revealed more than just the ramblings of a solitary doll maker. They hinted at something darker. The police reports were inquiries into several children who had mysteriously disappeared over the years, cases that grew cold and were eventually forgotten by everyone but those who had lost. Venturing into town, I hoped to gather more than just supplies. The locals, however, were not as welcoming as I had hoped. Their eyes were cautious, their words measured. In the town's quaint diner, overheard conversations paused as I approached, resuming only when I'd passed. It was Mrs. Eldridge, the owner of the diner, who, after some hesitation, finally spoke to me. Your great uncle was a strange man, she said, pouring coffee with a trembling hand. People here, they wondered about him, about those dolls and the children who vanished. Her voice dropped to a whisper. Some say he took those kids, made them into those dolls of his. The weight of her words hung heavy in the air as I walked back to the mansion the echoes of the past whispering with each step. Determined to uncover the truth, I returned to the doll workshop, a room I had avoided since my first unsettling discovery. It was there, behind a false wall I accidentally discovered, when a misplaced doll fell and tapped against it hollowly, that I found the hidden door. 
With a mix of dread and resolve, I pushed the door open, revealing a narrow staircase spiraling down into darkness. At the bottom, I found a secret chamber, meticulously organized and preserved. The air was cool and still, as if sealed away from the world above. Along the walls were shelves filled with personal items, small shoes, worn toys, hair ribbons frayed with age. Each item was tagged and cataloged with obsessive precision. Photographs of children, the same ones from the wall upstairs, were pinned next to detailed records and beside each, a corresponding doll. My hands trembled as I realized the extent of what I was seeing. This secret room was a shrine, a morbid memorial to each missing child. The dolls weren't just figures of art. They were effigies, capturing the essence of children who had once laughed, played, and then vanished. The realization that my great uncle might have been involved in something so heinous was overwhelming. I needed answers, and I knew they were hidden here, within these walls and the cryptic writings he left behind. My resolve hardened. I would uncover the truth, no matter how dark it might be. In the eerie silence of the secret chamber, I pored over the meticulous records my great uncle had left behind. Each entry was a biography of a lost child, detailing not just their life and sudden disappearance, but also the precise manner in which their doll was crafted. The dolls, I realized with a chilling clarity, were more than mere memorials. They were vessels, capturing the essence of each child in haunting detail. My hands shook as I read the doll's glassy eyes watching me from their perches. As I dived deeper into my great-uncle's diaries, a narrative began to unfold, one that painted a picture of a man torn between genius and madness. He wrote of the world's cruelty, of children lost to neglect and abuse, and of his mission to save them. In their new form they are loved and cherished forever, he penned in a shaky scrawl. Here, they are safe, forever children in a sanctuary of their own. His words twisted a knife of doubt in my mind. Was he a protector warped by his own grief, or a predator cloaked in delusional benevolence? My days were consumed by the investigation, each discovery dragging me further away from the world outside. Nights were spent wandering the halls of the mansion, where whispers of the past seemed to echo through the air, a constant reminder of the legacy I now shouldered. The local community, already distant, grew openly hostile. Whispers turned to wary glances, then to outright avoidance. The old grocer, Mr. Hawkins, his voice trembling with suspicion, finally voiced the village's fears one morning. Your uncle was no saint, and now strange things happen since you've come back. Just what are you up to in that old house of yours? The tension in town escalated when a local child went missing. A young boy who had wandered too close to my estate, they said. The timing was disastrous. As search parties formed and police inquiries began, the pointed fingers turned my way. The situation forced me to a decision point. Could I continue this solitary investigation with the town against me? Or should I reveal all and seek help? Choosing transparency, I invited the sheriff and a small group of locals to view the secret chamber, to see the truth of my great-uncle's obsession. Their horror mirrored my own as they took in the rows of dolls the wall of photographs, and the detailed logs of each child's life and transformation. He thought he was saving them, I explained, my voice hollow. He believed the world had abandoned these children, and this was his way of keeping them safe. Forever. The revelation did not bring the understanding I had hoped for. Instead, it sowed deeper seeds of fear and mistrust. As I stood before the community, their faces a mix of horror, sorrow, and suspicion. I realized that my quest for answers had only deepened the shadows cast by my family's legacy. Yet, amidst the chaos, an unexpected ally emerged. Ms. Eldridge, the diner owner, whose own sister had vanished years ago. Let's find the truth once and for all, she whispered to me, her eyes resolute. Together we resolved to dig deeper, to unravel the full story behind each doll. Perhaps in doing so, we could restore the missing pieces of the town's heart, pieces that had been lost to fear and time. I knew that each step would take us closer to either redemption or damnation, and I prayed silently that we were ready for either. 
as the autumn leaves began their descent, signaling the end of one season and the start of another. I sat in the dim light of the workshop, the final diary of my great uncle open before me. His words were etched with a frantic urgency, a stark contrast to the precise, meticulous entries of his earlier journals. This was his confession, a raw outpouring of a troubled mind. My creations are not mere playthings, he wrote, his handwriting deteriorating into an almost illegible scrawl. They are protection for souls too pure for this cruel world. I have seen the forgotten tears of children, heard the silent screams of despair. They come to me, lost and forsaken, and I do what I must to protect them. It was a chilling admission of his life's work, abducting children he viewed as neglected or endangered, then preserving their likenesses in his dolls. He saw himself not as a kidnapper, but as a guardian angel, rescuing them from a world that, in his eyes, had failed them. I sat back, the weight of his words pressing down on me. The line between madness and benevolence had blurred into obscurity in his mind. My resolve hardened in that moment, knowing what I had to do. His actions, though perhaps well-intentioned, had caused irreparable harm. Families were torn apart, lives shattered by his misguided crusade. The truth needed to come out. I picked up the phone, dialing the number for the local police. My voice was steady as I reported my findings, requesting an official investigation into the children linked to the dolls found in the chamber. I outlined everything. The secret room, the detailed records, and the diary entries that confessed the harrowing truth. The police were quiet on the other end, absorbing the gravity of the revelations, before promising to send detectives to the estate. The decision to go public was not taken lightly. I knew that revealing this would forever alter the legacy of my family. The name that I carried would be marred by scandal and horror. Yet, as I prepared to face the inevitable public scrutiny and backlash, a sense of duty fortified me. This was about justice for those children and their families, about bringing peace to souls that had been restless for far too long. As I waited for the police to arrive, I walked through the rows of glassy-eyed dolls, each a monument to a lost child. The workshop, once a place of eerie stillness, now felt like a chamber of echoes, the whispered goodbyes of children who could finally hope for closure. This was the end of one chapter and the painful beginning of another where truth, no matter how dark, would shine a light on the past. When the police arrived at the estate, they conducted a methodical and comprehensive investigation. The records I had uncovered in the secret chamber proved crucial, allowing them to confirm the identities of several missing children. As the scope of the tragedy unfolded, the local community's initial suspicion melted into a somber understanding. Neighbors and townsfolk, once wary and distant, began to offer their assistance, participating in the investigation and providing any information that could shed more light on the decades-long mystery. As I watched the police carry away the dolls, each a silent sentinel of a child's stolen innocence, a profound sadness enveloped me. The weight of my family's legacy pressed heavily upon my shoulders. Reflecting on the complex tapestry of my great-uncle's actions, his misguided attempt to protect and preserve the essence of these children, I resolved to transform this place of sorrow into one of remembrance. The mansion, with its dark secrets now exposed, would become a memorial museum dedicated to the lost children. My hope was that it would serve as both a sanctuary for their memories and a cautionary tale about the intricate and often perilous nature of human intentions. This place, marked by both pain and care, would stand as a testament to the enduring impact of our choices and the possibility of redemption through truth. I'm Jack, the unofficial leader of our small but skilled group. With me were Maria, who could crack any safe or security system, and Simon, a big guy with nerves of steel and hands equally suited for climbing or fighting, should it come to that. We'd scoped out the old Henderson mansion for days, watching for any signs of life or security. Nothing stirred, and no one entered or left. It was a relic waiting to be claimed. It was supposed to be an easy score. The mansion on the edge of town had always been the subject of rumors. Hidden rooms, buried treasure, the whole spiel. 
when old man Henderson, a millionaire with no heirs or family, supposedly died last month. The place sat silent and seemingly forgotten. That's when we decided it was our turn to explore those rumors. We gathered our gear under the cover of a new moon, cloaked by the night's embrace. Our plan was simple. Get in, find whatever valuables we could, and get out before dawn. We were pros at this kind of work, moving silently and swiftly with precision. Confidence was high, the stakes even higher. As we approached the towering gates of the Henderson estate, the mansion loomed like a specter in the darkness, its grandeur faded by years of neglect but imposing all the same. Looks dead enough, Simon whispered as he cut through the rusted padlock with bolt cutters. We slipped inside, our flashlights cutting narrow swaths through the blackness. The plan was in motion, but even as we moved deeper into the belly of the mansion, a nagging sensation tugged at the back of my mind. It was too quiet, too still. But greed pushed caution aside. After all, we thought the mansion was empty. We couldn't have been more wrong. Once inside the gates, the real work began. The mansion's security system was outdated, almost as ancient as the rumors that shrouded the place. Maria made quick work of the old alarm panel, her fingers dancing over the wires with practiced ease. All clear, she murmured, and a wave of relief washed over me. This was supposed to be easy. We split up to cover more ground. The mansion was a labyrinth of rooms and corridors, each more lavish than the last. The air was heavy with dust and disuse, or so it seemed. As I ventured through what appeared to be the main living room, the beam from my flashlight fell upon a grand piano, its surface gleaming under a thin layer of dust. It felt like walking through a time capsule. Then I noticed something odd, a newspaper, not more than a day old, laid out as if someone had just finished reading it. My pulse quickened. I grabbed my radio. Guys, you might want to see this, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. Meeting up in the kitchen, the signs were undeniable. There were fresh vegetables on the counter and a pot on the stove that still held the warmth of a recent meal. Maria looked at me, her eyes wide. Jack, someone's been living here, she whispered, the stark realization setting in. Simon checked the back door. It was bolted tight from the inside. A shiver ran down my spine. This doesn't make sense, I muttered. The place was supposed to be empty. As the reality sank in, our confidence shattered. Every shadow seemed to move. Every silence was heavy with the weight of unseen eyes. We should have left, but the allure of what might be hidden deeper within the mansion urged us on. Ignoring the primal scream of instinct, we pressed deeper into the mansion, unaware of what awaited in the darkness. The deeper we ventured, the heavier the air felt, as if the mansion itself was warning us to turn back. It started with a faint noise, a clatter from below that could have been dismissed as the house settling if not for its rhythmic tapping. Did you hear that? Maria's voice was a mix of curiosity and fear. We stopped, listened, and there it was again, tap, 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 coming from the basement. Simon led the way to the basement door, his confidence bolstering our resolve. Probably just rats, he grunted, though his usual bravado seemed hollow in the echoing halls of the mansion. Despite our mounting apprehension, the lure of hidden treasures pushed us onward. After a brief, tense debate, we agreed to explore the basement. We can handle this, I reassured myself and the others, though my voice faltered. With a deep breath, I swung the door open, and we descended into the bowels of the mansion. The air grew colder as we reached the bottom, our flashlights slicing through the overwhelming darkness. The basement was vast, filled with shadows that danced just beyond the light's reach. Then, without warning, our beams caught the figure of a man. No, more a phantom of a man, rugged and wild, his eyes reflecting the light like an animal caught in headlights. He stood frozen for a split second before letting out a guttural roar that echoed off the stone walls. This was his domain, and we were the intruders. He charged, fueled by a mix of fear and anger. We scattered, dodging behind old furniture and crates, our hearts pounding in our chests. Who are you? I shouted, hoping to reason with him, but the only reply was his continued aggression. 
It was clear he had lived in isolation for far too long. The lines between man and beast blurred by solitude. As he advanced, it became a primal battle of survival. We had to decide quickly. Fight or flee. Panic erupted within me as the resident, a ghostly figure now alive with rage, used his intimate knowledge of his darkened lair to his advantage. We sprinted through the corridors, the sounds of our breaths loud in our ears. But he was faster, more familiar with this maze of shadows than we could ever be. I heard Maria's breath catch as she stumbled, a wrong turn, a moment's hesitation, and she was gone from my sight, lost in the winding passages. From Maria's perspective, the separation was instant and disorienting. Jack? Simon? Her voice echoed off the damp walls, swallowed by the dark. No answer came. Alone, the narrow beam of her flashlight her only guide, she pushed forward. The basement felt alive, each shadow twisting as if watching, each whisper of wind a breath on her neck. The sound of footsteps, sometimes distant, sometimes terrifyingly close, kept her moving, kept her heart racing. The minutes stretched endlessly. When the steps finally moved away, her relief was short-lived. She had to keep moving. With a deep, quiet breath, she edged forward, her hands feeling ahead for obstacles, her mind imagining what lay in wait in the darkness. Above the sound of her own careful movements, the distant sounds of scuffles reached her, Simon and me, still evading our relentless pursuer. We had to regroup, had to find a way out together. But first, she had to find her way back to us, navigating through a labyrinth designed not to welcome, but to ensnare. After what felt like hours of terrifying solitude in the cramped corridors, the beam of my flashlight finally fell on Maria's pale, frightened face. She emerged from a narrow passage. I thought I was done for, she whispered hoarsely, her relief palpable. We quickly shared our experiences, realizing that this house, his domain, had turned into our nightmare. But we couldn't afford to let fear paralyze us any longer. Pooling our collective knowledge of security and the mansion's layout, we crafted a hasty plan. Simon had noticed the resident relied on certain paths, predictable in his ferocity. Using this insight, we decided to set traps along these routes, repurposing old wires and heavy furniture to create blockades and tripwires. Our goal was clear. Distract and delay him long enough to secure our escape. With our plan set, tension strung tight among us. We moved with purpose. The traps were crude, but necessary. As we worked, the residents' footsteps echoed through the halls, a constant reminder of the danger we were in. Finally, we lured him into a narrow corridor rigged with a tripwire connected to a heavy bookcase. The moment he tripped, the case toppled, the crash echoing as we bolted towards the exit. With a bit of luck, it would hold him long enough. We ran through the mansion's twisting corridors, the exit finally in sight. As we burst through the front door into the cold night air, freedom never felt so sweet, yet so bitterly won. Our chests heaved with exertion and fear as we put distance between us and the mansion. As we slowed to a stop, gasping for breath under the cover of the trees, the reality of what had happened, and what could still happen, settled in. Should we call the cops? Maria asked a reasonable part of her still functioning. But how could we explain our presence there without exposing our own crimes? After a tense debate, we decided against it, the risk of self-incrimination too great. We walked away from the Henderson mansion empty-handed, the night's horrors echoing in our minds. We agreed never to speak of it again, the pact sealed by our shared terror. As we disappeared into the night, the mansion loomed in the darkness behind us a silent sentinel of secrets better left undiscovered.